Welcome to the UCFA Book Club. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you as ever to Amandeep and the whole UCFA team for continuing to treat us to such incredible speakers every week. Um, as I'm sure you'll all agree, the opportunity to connect with our history and heritage gives us invaluable insight into who we are and who we might strive to become. And it was in this spirit that I first came to know our speaker today. On my 25th birthday, my mum gave me a copy of White Moguls, a book that proved to be a turning point in my own journey towards understanding my mi mixed British Indian identity. Its author, William Dalrymple, is one of Britain's greatest historians and a name that is now synonymous with India. Over the last 20 years, William's work has popularised Mughal and British Indian history by unearthing forgotten documents and sources, injecting his prose with the kind of detail and intrigue usually reserved for fiction. The company quartet, which we're discussing today, brings together his four masterworks into a single collection. For anyone looking to start their own adventure, this is the box set to binge. We're talking of adventures, I hear the box set itself had a bit of its own adventure in the Suez Canal, William. <laughs> It did. I don't know whether I don't know whether anyone's seen the bulk of this thing, but uh, whether it was responsible for the Suez Canal uh, uh, traffic jam or whether it was just a victim of it, we don't know. But it certainly arrived in London three weeks late from its appropriately Indian publishing uh, uh, press, where it was being uh, churned out uh, in its uh, uh, in all its gorgeous glory. And I'm very, I have to say, I'm very thrilled. Very much for Bloomsbury is watching. It. He's done an incredible job. Uh, mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy, as not all the books are published by uh, One in the UK series is published by Harp Collins. In India, two of them are published by Penguin. And it took quite a lot of neg negotiation to get them all recovered, packaged up in a, uh, in a single package. But they do look very pretty, and I'm very thrilled with the whole thing. Oh, uh, and I'm very glad the <laughs> I didn't realise that. So, with the, the, so there was a sort of a rights issue. You had to wrangle the, uh, who could actually print them in what, on what country. Correct. So it, it, it all took a bit of negotiation, and, the, and I should thank here the actual head of Bloomsbury, Nigel Newton, who actually owns the company, um, who personally got on the phone uh, and and spoke to the various people. Um, and it's happened, so it's very thrilling to see it like this. Uh, oh. Not quite as big selling yet as the Peaky Blinders box set. Just <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all, we're all incredibly grateful for the hard work. Um, was my thing working there we go um so so tell us a little bit about the, the the four books that make up the quartet because they um they're perhaps not you wrote them in an order that perhaps you sh we should read them in a slightly different order to the order in which you wrote them is what i'm trying to say correct you put them up correctly uh in the order that they were written uh which is not the chron chronological order which i would now advise anyone to read them in because they do tell uh, uh, a unified story. Uh, oh, very neat, Jasper. This is a yeah, very I knew you'd like that. <laughs> very good. You didn't tell me that was coming. So exactly. <laughs> so the correct order to uh, 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 read them in is the Anarchy, which opens in 1599, the year that Shakespeare is writing Hamlet, uh, and tells the story of the formation and rise of what was initially just a, a perfectly ordinary trading company. Uh, trying to compete rather ineffectively with the Portuguese and the Dutch, who were already in action, uh, bringing spices back from Indonesia. It wasn't even aimed at India. Then gradually, through accidents and through failure, in fact, um, through the fact that the East India Company from England was far less well-financed and far less well-organized, with less uh, talented sailors than the Dutch East India Company, uh, the VOC, um, the East India Company changed direction and started trading mainly in textiles with India. And that led to uh, an ever-growing engagement with Bengal, which was the source of most textiles. And by the early 18th century, uh, the East India Company turned into a military force, uh, initially fairly defensively, but then increasingly aggressively. Uh, and uh, by well, 1803 is the year, 1802 to 1803 is the year that they take over Mughal Delhi. And by that point, they're pretty well in control of most of uh, South Asia. And 1802 to 1803 is the year that they, they fight the, uh, the Anglo-Maratha War and capture the person of Shah Alam, the Mughal emperor, who they then use as their puppet. And this is still, the, the point I'm trying to make in this way, this is still being done not by the British government, as, as most of us assumed and, and history books have tended to uh, indicate, but uh, by a a, a, a limited company, a corporation based out of one office in London. And 
during the time that the Battle of Plassey was being fought, the Battle of Buxar, two big battles that established company supremacy, it wasn't even a big office. It was just six windows wide in Leadenhall Street, set back slightly from the street. Um, here is the very picture, just again, very quick on his, uh, on his PowerPoint. Um, it's the building in the middle. It's not even the two buildings inside. Two, the two tall buildings, bigger than the East India Company, are not, are not the company. It is just six windows in the middle. And from that office, an extraordinary corporate coup was pulled off, whereby a, a very small number of English business managed to use Indian capital borrowed from Indian bankers to buy Indian mercenaries who then defeated their political enemies. And again, in, in conventional history books, you get the impression that this is a bunch of white uh, sort of buccaneers bravely fighting all comers. It, it's rubbish. Uh, the people who fought these battles, like Plassey and Buxa, uh, and uh, the battles against the Marathas, such as Asse, and then ultimately the battles against the Sikhs, uh, like Chilliwala and so on, uh, were um, from Eastern UP uh, and from uh, Bihar. Uh, and a few of them from Telangana. Uh, and this extraordinary trick that the company pulls off uh, is the subject of the anarchy. So the second book uh, is the one that I think you read first, uh, uh, just uh, the white moguls. And that is a micro story. This takes place just between 1795 and 1805. So it's a story of 10 years. It's the story of a love affair between a beautiful and irresistible Persian girl uh, and a Scotsman called James Achilles Kirkpatrick. And um, Kirkpatrick found this girl uh, absolutely extraordinary and, and changed everything in his life uh, to be with her. And he converted to Islam. He uh, arranged a, a major alliance between the Hyderabadis and the East India Company. And while originally there had been several competing powers in the deck, Tipu Sultan was probably the most powerful, uh, in the 1790s, followed by the Marathas, followed by the Hyderabadis, uh, and the company and the French. Uh, in the end, the two uh, powers which survived into the 20th century were the company in the form of the Raj and the Hyderabad state, uh, uh, which, uh, and it was the result of this alliance forged over this love, uh, which, um, uh, which created this. And what's wonderful about uh, the sources I use from white moguls is that very... Well, don't don't give it away too much so just yet, because we're going to dig into that. We're going to dig into that in, de in detail, so I don't want to just... Okay, on to the <laughs> third, uh, the, the heroine of um, white moguls is seen, last seen, uh, as an old lady in 1835, uh, oh, sorry, the middle-aged lady in 1835, writing to her grandmother to the life of Hyderabad uh, in 1830. And the next book opens in 1839, and that's the story of the, the widest extent of the company. The company which starts off as a small um, player uh, failing to compete with the Dutch, by now is not only controlling all of South Asia and eyeing hungrily the Punjab, because of course uh, Ranjit Singh is still alive at this period, and uh, uh, the, the Sikh Khalsa is, is still uh, very much a force to be reckoned with. Uh, but in 1839, the company make, takes this reckless move soon after uh, uh, Ranjit Singh to go, sorry, so while Ranjit Singh is still just alive, to go through the, uh, uh, his territory, uh, up the Bolan Pass and into Afghanistan. And for a few years, it looks like it's, it's been a huge success that the company uh, has now got the Sikh Khalsa in the Nutcracker, it's north and south uh, of the Punjab, uh, and uh, the company controls as far as the, uh, the Indus. It's, uh, sorry, from the Indus to the Oxus. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, you know, this incredible reach of territory uh, further than the Mughals managed to conquer. But uh, as everyone who knows the story uh, is aware, the, uh, the thing ends in disaster. Uh, Shah Shuja pr proves uh, a, a more capable uh, but less reliable ally than the company had wished. They do not wish to give him the power that he wishes to have. They fall out, and in the ensuing uprising, um, the whole of uh, Afghanistan rises up, various different factions uh, emerge, and in the retreat from Kabul, uh, an entire East India Company army is slaughtered in the snows of Afghanistan. In the traditional picture, 
uh, painted by Lady Butler, one man alone, Dr. Bryden, emerges from Jalalabad uh, after this whole army has been cut to pieces in the snow in the passes. In reality, there were a few more survivors than that. Many more are enslaved or captured or uh, sort of reappear months later in rags in India, having begged their way out of Afghanistan. Uh, and this is the ultimate hubris of the country, the moment they try to take uh, a great chunk of Central Asia and then pack it. And this leads inevitably to the next and final volume of the quartet, which is the last book. And that tells the story of how many of the same sepoys who survived the, uh, uh, the, the Afghanistan campaign rise up against the company a few years later uh, in 1857, in what will become the largest anti-colonial uprising um, in colonial history. Uh, and 100,000 sepoys uh, who are the paid mercenary, Indian mercenary soldiers of the company are so irritated by the company, uh, by their particularly their policies of Christianization, uh, the activities of missionaries, the uh, shoving of Christian symbols uh, into their faces on parade and into their barracks and so on. And the widespread belief that the company is about to um, organize a mass conversion uh, that a lot of that the, 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 the these sepoys rise up against their officers, and most of them march again, contrary to what you learn in Indian textbooks, certainly, most of them march to Delhi. Mangal Pandi and the great rising Barrett Ball, which is the one most uh, storied by people like Savarkar, is in fact a minor outlier. Uh, the great mass of the uprising is all about putting the Mughal emperor back on the throne, uh, and that is uh, Bahad Shah Zafar. Uh, the trouble is that by this stage, Zappo, who's one of the most remarkable Mughal leaders, is uh, 80 years old and a, a poet and a mystic, and is no Che Guevara. He's not going to be jumping on the barricades and leading his men forwards. And in fact, he's very uh, dubious about the whole uprising. As by the time they arrive in Delhi, these are a rabble uh, who are not disciplined. They, many of them come without weapons or with, uh, without treasure uh, to fight the war. Uh, they won't agree on a single leader. They loot the people of Delhi. They rape the courtesans. Uh, and they start stealing things from the from the bazaar people of Delhi. And uh, Zafar realizes that this not only uh, is likely to fail, it's likely to take him and his dynasty with it, which is, of course, what ultimately happens. The, um, th there is no uprising in Punjab. Uh, the Sikh soldiers eventually uh, uh, support uh, the East India Company's uh, um, uh, campaign to retake Delhi. And it is the support of the Sikhs and the additional mercenary uh, additions from uh, Waziristan, the Pashtun soldiers, uh, which arrive outside Delhi in, uh, in September and um, turn the, 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 this uprising into a slaughter. And it's one of the greatest and most terrible war crimes conducted, uh, if not the greatest war crime conducted by uh, the British Empire in India. Uh, today, everyone remembers Jalim Wallabagh, which, terrible as it was, resulted in, in hundreds of deaths. The slaughters of, 18, uh, of 1857 and 8 uh, led to, at the least, tens of thousands of deaths of innocents, and quite possibly hundreds or several hundred thousand. The figures simply aren't available. Uh, but uh, there were wholesale slaughter uh, in the captured cities. Uh, Delhi, for example, we have very detailed information that every male above the age of 16 was considered a fair time. Uh, and uh, whether they were fighting, whether they were old men, whether they were uh, kids uh, hanging around in, in shops in, in the back streets, they were just bayoneted by the victorious uh, company troops. So it's a terrible story. Uh, and even at the time, it was regarded as uh, completely unacceptable. And in the immediate aftermath uh, of this violent and, and criminal suppression of this uprising, uh, not only is Delhi depopulated and the Mughal emperor exiled to Rangoon, but the company uh, is wound up, nationalized effectively, uh, its army absorbed uh, into the British army and its navy disbanded, uh, and uh, the Raj begins. And, and the Raj, of course, is what we think of when, when most of us think of British and India. Uh, it's become a kind of shorthand, three-letter word for everything that happened by the British in India, but technically, the Raj, which is the, the government of the British uh, uh, government in India, only lasted 90 years. While the East India Company, a commercial organization that existed only for the purpose of profit, ruled for 250. 
Uh, so it's a much longer period, and there's been far less, there's no movies, very few movies about East India Company, there's virtually no fiction. Um, you know, when we think of uh, uh, the Raj, we tend to think of Kipling and Curzon and these very familiar images of, of, of men in soda topies or sitting on the, on the verandas of clubs in the, in the Punjab or something. That whole story is just 90 years. Uh, and uh, it seems to be an instant answer to anyone that wants to take a positive view of Shabba, to remind them that, the, uh, that for most of the time that the British were in India, it was ruled by a company for profit. There was no other reason for the existence of the East India Company other than to give dividends to its shareholders and make a profit for its office, uh, office uh, holders and, and the directors. Uh, and so any idea that, uh, that this was something benign as people like uh, uh, Nigel Bigger, uh, who's just uh, given a CBE by this government this weekend uh, for his work uh, in, in promoting the British Empire's positive force. Well, his oppression... Uh, any idea that this was a positive <laughs> <laughs> angry. Uh, any idea that this was anything other than extractive looting and plundering operation by a commercial company um, uh, is to me completely absurd and uh, and, and contrary uh, to all the historical evidence from from both from British documents and and from Mughal and other Indian sources. I mean, talking of historical evidence, but perhaps part of the reason why some of this history has been untouched for so long is because the sources have just sort of been forgotten and the documents forgotten. I think there's, uh, you know, I think, um, if I just move on to my next, why is that? Yes. Um, your co-conspirator. Uh, my co-conspirator, Bruce Winnell. Absolutely. I'm very glad you've put this up. So Bruce was the, is the dead key of these four books and, um, the man Can I just before before you say, I just wanted to read a little excerpt from the, um, the, his obituary in the times, which I thought was wonderful. Uh, Bruce Winnell's only attempt at a traditional career came in his early 20s when he signed on with the Inland Revenue to become a tax inspector in Finsbury Park in North London. The story goes that this unlikely calling ended after two months when, on his way up the stairs to resign, he met a man coming down the stairs to sack him. <laughs> that was Bruce. Absolutely. <laughs> so Bruce went off after this to Persia, learned uh, perfect uh, Persian, taught at the University of Isfahan, uh, only left when he was kicked out after the revolution, moved to Peshawar, where he learned Pashtun uh, and lived for many more years, uh, and was this extraordinary figure who had these remarkable language skills, but only was he a specialist in reading old manuscripts and old inscriptions uh, from the, uh, well, all periods of, uh, of really Islamic history. Uh, a very fluent linguist who had not only every major European language, uh, but uh, Arabic, Persian, Pashtun, Hindi, Urdu, um, Punjabi, you know, he, he had just, he, he was also very musical, like many people who are extremely musical, he was able to uh, pick up languages with the ease that he could uh, play a Chopin uh, uh, duet or, or whatever. Um, and Bruce and I worked together on these books. Uh, I, he, I would find Persian sources uh, and would get them to Bruce. Bruce would come and stay and work through them with me. He didn't know the history so well, but he knew the language, uh, languages, plural, uh, amazing, with amazing fluency. And uh, well, Anarchy had a lot of stuff from the Indian National Archives, from um, the uh, British Library, the old Indian office collection, and also from some obscure places such as Tonk, uh, where uh, there's an amazing uh, Islamic library uh, with wonderful Persian uh, biographies of Shah Alam, for example, which no one had ever accessed before. White Moguls is based very largely on the work of a, uh, an extraordinary Persian uh, 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 traveler in India called Abdul Latif Shushri, Tufat al Alam, uh, and Bruce translated that. Uh, and, I, and I was able to put it together with the Kirkpatrick letters, which uh, had turned up in the British Library at the same time. Um, for Return of a King, we used a lot of Afghan sources, which I sourced from Kabul. Uh, with the help of the current president, who was then uh, uh, teaching history at Kabul University, uh, found this wonderful old bookshop where all the uh, Afghan aristocracy had, had sold off their libraries when they were leaving in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and I was able to buy the very, very good uh, uh, Afghan sources, which um, were written in the aftermath of what was the major event of 19th century Afghan history, and they equivalent of Battle of Britain at the time they saw off the British. Um, and then finally, uh, an amazing collection called the Mutiny Papers in the International Archive was the main source for um, 
the uh, uh, the last book, the, the last movie. And Bruce was just wonderful. He not only was he uh, a translator, but he was also a very rigorous editor and guide. He knew this world so intimately. Uh, and whenever I would hand, hand him a draft of the book, it would come back with minute squiggles all over it. And, no, 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 this can't be right. Have you checked this? Please immediately double check this point. <laughs> uh, and uh, and it, they were withering. It was often, you know, one had to be quite sort of uh, uh, resilient to withstand the, the critical mauling that he would give every draft. But uh, um, this was the uh, uh, this this was the, the what he put every book through. And as a result, there have been remarkably few. Uh, uh, errors ever spotted in these books, uh, factual errors, uh, I, and I'm very grateful to because there would be many, many more. <laughs> and am I right in thinking the quartet's uh, sort of in his memory, as it were? It's very much in his memory. I, he he lived uh, to see the publication of the last volume, uh, The Anarchy, came to the launch and told me at the launch that uh, uh, he was slightly worried about uh, some stomach pains he was having and was going, on to, going off to see a doctor. And it turned out to be very advanced pancreatic cancer, which killed him within three months. Uh, a very, very quick and tragic end. Oh, so I, would, I was at the launch, so I didn't realise he he was there. I, well, I didn't realise yeah. he was at the time. Um, that's a oh, how sad. Um, uh, and what that's a legacy. Yeah. Um, anyway, he he is no more, very tragically, and and with that, um, th this quartet is very definitely cl uh, closed. I, mean, I, I will not probably. Return yeah. to the areas. I've lost. I was going to say, I, I know you've said in to the Narnia wardrobe, if you like. <laughs> and I know you've said in 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 other talks when you've you know been asked for advice as to what would you for young historians coming up who or you know historians of any age who are interested in this period of history or contributing to the work uh, that you've pioneered. It's essentially to learn these languages because there are immense treasure troves of archives and documents sitting there Correct. untouched that have just not yet been translated. This is absolutely right. And it's, it's, it's especially true, I think, of, of Sikh history, um, uh, where you know, there are vast quantities of, of archives lying in Lahore, but in Persian, which is a language now that very few people in India or Pakistan can read and speak anymore. Uh, and um, Persian was the diplomatic and court language of most courts in the 12th to the 19th century. So most historical documents in India, surprisingly, are in the Persian language. Uh, and while there are many, many brilliant South Asian historians uh, who are capable of reading the English language, for instance, uh, and who do that very frequently, and so whenever you go into the India office library at the top of the British Library, you will see, you know, there's never less than 100 people working away on the India office papers. Uh, the number of people who are actually working on Persian language sources are, are, can be you know, never more than a handful. And uh, that's true of India too. Very, very few historians today can really read with any fluency the, um, uh, uh, the Persian language source. And I found this is a major problem when, when Bruce was unable to do something for me, because either he was doing something else or he simply didn't have enough time to do all, all the stuff that we needed reading. Trying to find anyone else who could who could tackle these documents with the fluency and nuance and uh, literary uh, ability that Bruce, I just simply never found anyone else. Uh, I mean, there are a couple of other people uh, who are you know, often very busy, but it, that is literally the case. And so if you are a young, uh, if you get yourself a uh, fluent Persian and, and, and learn also the, um, the, the Hindi and the Urdu that you need to read the, the Indian work, in these texts, you put yourself instant at the front of the uh, of the game. Uh, this is uh, uh, th these are skills which will 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 set you up to give and, and give you access to extraordinary numbers of sources which are there, readily available in Indian national archives. At least it was before Indian national archives got closed for uh, Mr. Modi's current Central Vista project. So God knows what's going to happen when those documents are going to be accessible. Um, uh, but Indian National Archives and many other, many other wonderful libraries across South Asia uh, and Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, so uh, yeah, those, those yeah. These, these four books have uh, heavily relied on, on Persian language sources as translated by Bruce. Well, let's dive, uh, let's dive into the story then. Um, I mean, yeah. we've, we've touched on 
um obviously east india company their offices how they started out very small i think there were only was it 35 employees in this building um ridiculous yeah. um but this was like this image has become quite a, like a key i mean a, a, a totally yeah. made up image um but it represents something uh quite uh quite pivotal correct this is a, a, a painting painted by a man called Benjamin west in london who'd never been to india had no idea what it looked like that didn't stop him painting it. Uh, and uh, uh, Benjamin West uh, is showing here the Diwani, which is the moment that Shah Alam, the defeated Mughal emperor, uh, who had just received a major uh, defeat at the Battle of Buxta, uh, was pressurized by the East India Company in the person of uh, Robert Clive uh, to sign away the financial management of the three richest states of his kingdom. And those states were Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. And it's rather like, um, imagine if uh, uh, the EU were to uh, defeat Britain militarily and force Boris to sign away financial management of uh, uh, Kent, London, and the Southeast to a private Belgian company. Just to give you uh, 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 a kind of fictional uh, comparison. And these three richest states were, were rich because they were the center of the textile industry, uh, which the East India Company had utilized to make itself the largest corporation in the world, over a million looms throughout Bengal uh, and Arista. And uh, by seizing the right to uh, tax, they uh, proceeded to, in modern terms, asset strip these incredibly rich parts of India and to ship the money, profits back to London. And very frequently at this period, men who had spent maybe 10 or 12 or 20 years in India would ship back between a million and a million and a half pounds at the end of their, uh, their, 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 their service in India. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, this would be collectible in this building that you put up, the Leadenhall Street uh, had, so this uh, is actually company. the same building that we saw previously, but it's just been expanded and like refurbished, which I don't think I yeah, really realized at this time. The and, and like the kind of most terrible neighbors, they, they seem to expand down the street and then Wall Street buying all the adjacent properties uh, and knocking them down and creating, the, you know, something that's a bit like Buckingham Palace by this stage, by, mm. by 1900. Um, sorry, by, by 1800. And um, they... Uh, Yes, the, 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 so the company by, uh, by military force expands through the fractured post-Mughal states of South Asia. Remember that at the time of the Mughals, um, there was the, the, the largest, richest empire in Eurasia. It produced about 40% of the world's GDP. After Nadir Shah destroyed the, uh, the Mughal, uh, captured Delhi, destroyed the Mughal treasury and took it off to Central Asia, the Mughal Empire breaks up, fractures like if you've taken a mirror and thrown it out the window, imagine all the, uh, the glass pieces uh, smashing on the pavement. That's what happened to the company. Uh, it, uh, and the, sorry, that's what happened to the Mughal Empire. And the company then Ubers it up one by one. And by uh, 1800, there are twice as many soldiers in the East India Company's private army as there are in the British Army. There are 100,000 in the British Army. and 200,000 in the company's private army. And those are Indian soldiers, uh, usually from, uh, uh, from Bihar and, and Eastern UP, usually uh, Brahmins or Rajputs, and they are mercenaries fighting for the company and defeating successively um, Tipu, the Marathas, and then finally the Sikhs. Uh, and uh, they have complete control of India, which they then asset strip. And, and in, in a sense, the reason why India goes from being uh, the richest country in the world to one of the poorest is, is this process by which wealth is taken out of one country and sucked into Britain. And when you go around, for example, all those gorgeous National Trust houses, most of them which are built in the uh, 18th century, are either built with money made in uh, the slave trade in the Caribbean or uh, for money uh, made by the East India Company. In the case of places like Powers Castle, uh, yes, in, yeah, Powers in Castle. Well, and then to be honest, like, there's there's so much to dig into on on the anarchy. But I mean, we did do a whole 
hour <laughs> and more chat last year, which I think if people want to dig more into the events of the Anarchy, we can they can find that on the Ukfa YouTube channel. Um, I, I, one quick question, which I don't think I actually managed to ask last time on the Anarchy, though. You mentioned the Moguls being the, the wealthiest sort of um, uh, state empire at, at the time. Um, in Frankopan's Silk Roads, he argues that the Mo mogul wealth came at the expense of the Americas, i.e. Spanish gold, because of what was being traded. Um, and so is that, is, does the, actually the source of mogul wealth sort of need inspecting as well as an imperial um, entity? What I think Peter Frankopan means by that is that the um, Spanish and Portuguese gold and silver, which had been mined uh, by the conquest of the Aztecs and the Incas and the other uh, 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 indigenous peoples of South America, that a lot of that gold ended up in South Asia. But it didn't end up because of uh, plunder. It ended up because everyone wanted to buy goods from South Asia. And what South Asia made at this, pro at this point, which is what gained it its wealth, was not um, uh, you know, the Mughal conquest uh, just sort of creating wealth. No, it was the, it was the, the manufacturing of, of textiles. And the East India Company becomes rich in the same way because it's by shipping Indian and Mughal textiles around the globe, uh, they, for example, create deindustrialization in Mexico uh, by the sheer quantity of Indian textiles being uh, cheap, high quality Indian textiles being imported there. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, a lot of the money which starts in, in, the, in the ground in Latin America arrives through mining and, and, and conquest in Spain and Portugal then finds its way uh, to the city of London, where it's shipped out to India to buy goods uh, from Indian manufacturers. Uh, so and then the globalization that, started pretty early on, didn't it? And that, those same coins then get shipped back to London in the, in, uh, as the profits of East India Company merchants. So it's a, um, I mean, it's very interesting. When one thinks of the moguls, particularly if you're if you're from a South Asian background, you tend to think of sort of Bollywood films of Ashwari, Rai, and Ritik Roshan showering rose petals on each <laughs> other uh, and uh, sort of playing with pigeons. What you don't see is that all the wealth that has generated that lifestyle has come from industry, from, from manufacturing. Um, and, and, and we don't have this image of the moguls as great manufacturers. We think of them just sort of you know, playing around in palaces and dancing around fountains, but uh, that way no empire is made. <laughs> So this scene uh, that we've sort of set now, which is at sort of the end of the um, 1790s, 1800s, this is the the stage that is set, the anarchy sets for the events of um, White Moguls, which I just wanted to spend a bit of time just diving into a bit more of the details of, because actually it came out in 2002 when these sort of online talks weren't really a thing. And just looking online, I just realized that I can watch several talks about the Anarchy or Return of a King or The Last Mogul, but there's not actually, other than your um, BBC documentary, which is not available on iPlayer at the moment, um, White Moguls is, you know, it's, dare I say, I have a favorite, my favorite, and it has been <laughs> overlooked. So I'm um, very selfishly, I'd like to dig into it in more detail. So please tell us about this gentleman here. So behind the story of, of conquest and looting, there's also a lot of individual stories of young British men who, uh, come out to India, and they're only, you know, you couldn't join the East India Company after the age of 16. The East India Company took them as pups, uh, fresh out of, you know, effectively O-levels, and they get sent out to Bengal, where they get put in uh, a kind of a, a Port William College uh, by the middle of the century, uh, which is there to train them in Indian languages and, and bookkeeping and so on. So by the age of 17 or 18, these kids, which is what they are, you know, are not old enough to get a drink in a bar in London today, are often running or helping run um, uh, company operations in very remote parts of India. And many of these also by, by the mid 18th century had, had mothers or, or fathers who were from South Asia, uh, who, who either, either company men who worked there or mothers uh, who were from there. One in three British men uh, by, the, by the mid 18th century, one in three British men uh, are either um, living with uh, or have children with uh, a South Asian woman. And these are all young men. There are no uh, women sent out by the East India Company. There's an entirely male, uh, British male operation to come out. And they intermarry. And in between the 1780s and 1800s, about one in three British men 
uh, is living with Indian women and inevitably they end up uh, uh, like uh, Patrick in the picture here, dressing in Indian dress, eating Indian clothes, uh, and living in a South Asian way. So while they're operating for an entirely extractive uh, 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 force like the East India Company, many of them individually are very attached to South Asia, uh, speak the languages, are interested in the religions, um, study the, the culture, and so on. And this is certainly the case with Patrick, who realizes that um, the East India Company is out to bully uh, the place that he's fallen in love with. Uh, and he marries his uh, his girlfriend, Karen Nisa, who he's already got pregnant, uh, and they have two kids. Sorry, just William, before we get to care, um, I just wanted to, he, court culture, the way in which people like James indulge the court culture, that was very much, it had diplomatic advantage, obviously, because that's how you did, did business. But, um, but James was also, he, he genuinely, loved it and i just want to thought if i've got this painting um here just as sort of like really exemplifies the court culture and the way in which yeah. um how much the the courtesans were a part of that culture as well um so this I think... is, uh, is the court of nizam ali khan who is the uh, nizam of hyderabad who rules around 1800 he is the son of nizam al mulk who was the, uh, the ruler who created, carved out the, the Hyderabad state at the end of the Mughal Empire. And uh, it describes it, they describe themselves in their own sources. As, they were very clear this was a kind of semi-detached fragment of Mughal Empire. They weren't something different, that they were culturally uh, uh, Mughal. And uh, it was a very mixed Hindu-Muslim world. Uh, many of the aristocracy were Muslim, but a great number of them were Hindu too, including the prime minister. Uh, and um, it prided itself on its painting. This painting is the work of uh, the great uh, artist Svenkachellum uh, uh, on its literature. Uh, and uh, we have one of Hyderabad's greatest poets, uh, the only woman in this picture, who uh, I saw you uh, ringed in an earlier version, here we go, uh, with, who is Malaka Bhai Chanda sitting in her, uh, in her palanquin with her cheetah, as one does uh, of, a, of an afternoon. Um, and uh, they are riding out uh, either on a, a hunting campaign or a battle, it's not clear. Uh, and this is the world we're talking about, and, and one can see why someone like Kirkpatrick was overwhelmed by it, because it is you know, incredibly glamorous. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful world full of art and literature and excitement and beautiful women and poetry. Uh, and individuals like Kirkpatrick were enormously enamoured of it. But his story is the story of how he, in a sense, turned against the company. Uh, thanks because of our to villain. the <laughs> of the big man, uh, who is Richard Wellesley, who was the very brilliant and ruthless elder brother of the Duke of Wellington, uh, who determined to conquer the whole of India for the company. Uh, his motive was uh, was not one of profit. He, he uh, was very much a government man who had come in towards the end of the company, but the government was getting more and more uh, powerful. Uh, over the company, the, the company went bust in 1770-1774, had to be bailed out by the British government, and one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, stipulations made by the government for bailing the company out when it had proved that it wasn't too big to fail, uh, was that the company, uh, uh, the, the government had the right to appoint a government general, and this was their appointment, who basically uses the East India Company's private army against the French. Well, this is the era of Napoleon. Napoleon has a plan to conquer uh, India, uh, he actually gets as far as Egypt and is all set to, uh, to launch uh, uh, an amphibious operation down the Red Sea from India, to, hoping to land on the Konkan coast and, and march in. And Wellesley sees it's his job to use the company's army uh, for, the, for the sake of the British government uh, and to conquer the rest of India and get rid of the French. And Kirkpatrick, uh, who by this stage is secretly converted to Islam, has secretly married Karenista, has secretly built behind the main residency, which is built in a Palladian style and looks very like the, uh, uh, the, the White House in Washington. Um, he has built a second building called the Rang Mahal, uh, which is a, a, a fantastic, um, the colored palace is, is a frescoed palace, frescoed by Venkatulam for Karenisa. And he lives this double life. By day, the company resident in a company red coat sitting in the Palladian classical building. And by night, 
the, uh, uh, the, the kurta wearing, kawali loving, Persian speaking husband of Karanisa with, uh, with Anglo Indian children or Anglo Persian children. Um, there was a particular and, incident uh, with the with the French garrison, I think, with it, that was the sort of a turning point for the exactly relationship that. between Kirkpatrick. Goes against, uh, a guy called Raymond, who is in charge of the French garrison in Hyderabad, he manages to surround them. They lay down their arms, start a fight. Uh, and uh, this is the first of the great victories that, uh, that Wellesley makes against the French uh, in this part of the world. And that uh, was when and, it was in the celebrations that followed that he then met. Karenisa, I believe. Exactly. And Karenisa, it's not clear whether it was a kind of sting operation or whether it was affection initially, but Karenisa uh, pops up at the residency after they've spotted each other at a, at a party and they exchange glances through a, through a grill uh, at uh, uh, the, the victory celebrations um, and then that subsequently at Karenisa's sister's room uh, where uh, Patrick's admitted to the house. Subsequent to that, Karenisa and her, um, her grandmother turn up at Kirkpatrick's house and they end up sleeping together. Now, there are a variety of interpretations at, uh, of this. Uh, one is that it seems that Karenisa was being forced into a marriage by the grandfather against her will. We don't know what was so terribly wrong with the, with the potential suitor, but certainly the, the women of the household united against this match and saw Kirkpatrick as a good way out, both in, in the sense that he was, he, he was uh, clearly a more attractive figure as far as Karenisa was concerned, uh, but also uh, one that was a, a major power in the state and, uh, and therefore diplomatically quite a, a, a clever alliance. Whether they were pushed into this by the prime minister, we don't know. But what we do know is that the prime minister found out about it and then blackmails Kirkpatrick. Uh, and uh, he doesn't really need to be. Here is the prime minister, his name is Aristotle Jar also by the artist Venkachalam. And, and Aristajar manipulates this. Uh, he has a meeting with, uh, with uh, Kirkpatrick in the bathhouse, which is where people meant, uh, went to have private conversations because no spies could uh, appear or no notebooks could be taken in, no, no recording equipment. <laughs> Today, I think when people meet health clubs, similar things like the meeting in the sauna. Uh, and uh, um, Kirkpatrick eventually becomes the willing uh, man who stitches this line between the company and Hyderabad. And Hyderabad survives as the largest producing state in India. As uh, many people here will know, uh, uh, India um, was not ever ruled entirely by the Raj. A fifth of India uh, was um, uh, ruled by the original princely rulers with a little supervision from a resident. Uh, and uh, the Hyderabad was the largest had the, it was the richest, uh, and it survived a year after uh, partition in 47, uh, when the Indian troops finally went in uh, in 1948 in Operation Polo uh, and took over Hyderabad by force. Uh, and this, so this, this state, which had a, a GDP larger than Belgium in 1947, uh, existed because of the alliance which was stitched together in the negotiations between Kirkpatrick and Aristotle. Uh, it's a very complicated and, and, and I had a story and I got very excited writing. Uh, this is Karenisa's uh, great friend. Uh, yeah, so just one thing, because there's, there's this turning point then that happens that once this sort of alliance is set up, things are going very well, but then Wellesley comes along and at the same time, there's this rise in essentially the, I, maybe this is an overstatement, you can correct me, but the, the invention of racism as we know it. Um, and the way that it affects the world today sort of comes about at this point and starts to basically destroy this syncretic world where cultures have met and crossed over and this sort of harmony gets totally disrupted. And this is sort of a, an image of that harmony and was a friend of Kirkpatrick. Exactly right. There is, I mean, one shouldn't over romanticize this, but, you know, the company was always an extractive force. Uh, and um, from the mid 18th century, the the, uh, the, the company was always a, a powerful force. But until that point, the company was not uh, the sole force in India. There were many forces which could have got rid of it, particularly the Marathas, particularly Tipu, uh, and at one point, even the Hyderabads. And so um, it's, it's a mistake to reflect back on this period, the certainties of the later Raj. Uh, this was a very different period. And at a point when the company was not dominant, uh, the company did not always behave with the racial attitudes that we associate with the British in India later. 
they were they were keen to intermarry. Uh, they uh, lived in Indian ways. Uh, the club, which uh, kept the British apart socially from Indians, uh, and and uh, the, the sort of the racial apartheid that we associate with the Raj, where you know you'd have notices saying no dogs and Indians, all that sort of thing, was very much a late 19th century creation. Uh, and was not the, the world that we have in front of us here. Here you have a picture of, of, of Major uh, William Palmer uh, with his Indian wife and her, her sisters and the Ayers and these mixed race children. And as one can see instantly on looking at this, this is not an image uh, of a, uh, a racial apartheid. It's, a, it, it's an image of, of a syncretic world which did exist, but which is rapidly coming undone. By the uh, in Wellesley's days, by the 1790s. I mean, is it, is it also important? Know. Sorry, is it also important to to say that though there wasn't discrimination necessarily on grounds of race at this time, he's married here to a Mughal princess. Kahir and Nisa's lineage is she's a Saidi. It's that there is very much a class distinction. I think I think you do dig into the book. James had other relationships with um so a lower ranking if we want to put it um women um but it was very much the fact that these relationships happened but it was it was very much class discrimination that was going on at, the, at this point in history well you have class meeting with class so, so in a sense you do have very serious marriages further down the social scale but it, it's among equals and and right. what you get is what you get at any other period of history you get uh, elite men exploiting uh, non-elite women. Um, uh, so in a sense, but it isn't, that isn't so much, it uh, doesn't have an rate overt racial character as the marriages, people like Palmer, Kirkpatrick and Octoloni show that uh, uh, elite, elite men did marry elite mobile women at this period. Uh, and the result of this alliance, but, uh, which is forged between uh, the Nizam and the company is this building, which is uh, almost the same date and almost the same plan as the White House in Washington, and which since the book was published has been saved from demolition uh, and has recently been um, nicely refurbished and entirely rebuilt and restructured uh, by an enormous uh, uh, check uh, written by a reader of the White Moguls who wrote just wrote a single check for one million pounds uh, wow. to have it recorded. Uh, and it was done through the World Monuments Fund, who've done a fantastic job. And uh, two years ago, the, the initial work ended and it was uh, opened up briefly. Then the interior work uh, is, is continuing right up to the moment where it's now going to be a museum of Hyderabadi history. Um, and I got an email yesterday from the man, funny enough, who's designing the exhibits, uh, who turns out to be Nandita Das, the actress's brother, uh, Siddhartha Das. Uh, and he is um, he's going to be doing the final work, setting up the displays on people like Kirkpatrick and Kerenisa within this building. So it's a very happy story. Uh, That's so incredible, because I must admit, like reading reading the book, I was I, I mean, I, the, I really want to visit. I wanted to visit this place since reading the book to, to now know that it's actually been saved and is being restored is, is really exciting because because like you say, the um, I've just got the. Um, the Zanana building as well that you sort of visited in your BBC documentary and it was sort of right as you can see from the photo and the inset photo it's run down dilapidated it's really sort of been left to go to waste uh so that has all been saved and pictures have turned out of the Rang Mahal um by Van Kachalam showing what it looked like and uh archaeology has been done restoration of the cemetery all complete now virtually just the interior work is is left um, so it's very exciting, yeah. And, wow. and so in that sense, um, White Moguls has has left this as, as its legacy. Very nice. Well, that yeah. well that um, is a wonderful happy ending. Uh, sadly, yeah. the story of Kirkpatrick it's less of a less of a happy ending. Um, this I should, the, I the, um, the this portrait out. is uh, slightly later than well, yeah, significantly later than the portrait we saw at the start. Graying hair, slightly a uh, tired look in his eyes. Um, when he moved, so he moved care into the residency, which then became a scandal. Um, but then his brother took the rap for it. I think that's what Correct. I seem to recall. That's what happened. Exactly right. Exactly right. And he's and because he pulls off this incredible alliance, which suits the company, he's allowed to stay. But then Patrick is summoned after Wellesley is sacked and sent home. Patrick has is uh, goes up to Calcutta. Uh, to brief the new uh, viceroy, new governor general, 
uh, Lord Cornwallis, and uh, he dies in Calcutta, leaving uh, Karanisa, a widow, aged only 21. She is then, after two years of mourning, seduced by um, Kirkpatrick's terrible assistant, who's called Henry Russell, who's a rotter, the First Order. Uh, and uh, she, he then drops her in favor of another girl, uh, and she dies of heartbreak back in her Rang Mahal. Um, and it, it's all, it's, it's a very tragic story. But the two children, who I think you also have a photograph, uh, who've been sent off back to England, painted by a chinnery before they went for their mother, this painting is snaffled by Henry Russell. And 30 years later, a woman walks into Henry Russell's house, looks at the painting and faints. And the reason she faints is it is Kitty, the, the daughter at the back of these two children here, who has now grown up and by pure chance has been taken to tea in this house. Russell is away, but uh, Kitty then investigates how come Henry Russell has got this picture of me as a child. And she discovers through contacts that her grandmother is still alive in Hyderabad. And I've got here, I just opened it up from the uh, White Moguls, this letter written by a daughter to a grandmother. And these two haven't seen each other since they parted at this age uh, in this picture uh, 30 years earlier. My dear grandmother, I often think of you and remember you and my dear mother. I often dream that I'm with you in India and that I see you both in the room you used to sit in. No day of my life has ever passed without my thinking of my dear mother. I can remember the, ver uh, the veranda, the place where the tailors work, and the place on the housetop where my mother used to let me sit down and slide. When I dream of my mother, I am in such joy to have found her again that I awake, or else I find I am pained to find that she cannot understand the English I now speak. I can well recollect her cries when we left her. And I can now see the place where she sat when we parted and her tearing her long hair. What worlds I would give to possess one lock of that beautiful and much loved hair. How dreadful to think that so many, many years have passed when it would have done my heart such good to think that you loved me. When I long to write to you and tell you these feelings that I was never able to express a letter which I'm sure would have been detained by my uncle. And now, how wonderful it is, after 35 years, that I'm able for the first time to hear that you think of me and love me. I have perhaps wondered why I did not write to you and that you have thought me cold and insensible to such near dear ties. I thank God that he has opened for me a way of making the feelings of my heart known to you. Will this letter reach you and will you care for the letter of your grandchild? My own heart tells me you will. May God bless you, my own dear grandmother. You can imagine what it was like when I found that in a safe in West London. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, for, for me, that's why White Moguls struck such a chord personally, because you know, I have, I have family in India, I have family that over the last year or so I've not been, I was meant to visit April 2020, my uncle there died, um, I've then had other family members who have, who have died since, and so that, that sense of disconnect was something that really resonated with me, but also just like how tragic and heartbreaking sad that story is, that the, the reason Kitty was in England was because at the age that they are painted here, they were sent to be educated in England, and I guess the intention was that they would be educated and come back to India and then within the space of... Able to cope in both worlds was the idea, but both their parents died. And, the, and in, in such a short time frame, like he went up to, I think, didn't he miss it? He, he was too ill to go to the, to the port or to the docks to see them off. But then he had the call to go up to Calcutta and then, and so he set off and then missed them by a day. So he had to travel regardless because he was under duty to do so. Traveled so sick that he ended up dying. He malaria uh, on, on the way and arrived in a terrible state in Calcutta where he died and is buried in Park Street Cemetery. And Ken, you said she, she died, she was 27, was she when, she, when she died, I think? 
So she's, she's, I think she's sort of 21 when, when uh, Kirkpatrick died. And um, she then goes up to, uh, goes up to Calcutta. And with this painting, she takes this painting with her, doesn't she? Painting with it on the back of an elephant, which is a nice wow. detail. This painting crosses India. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in Calcutta, it's admired by people here about this great chinnery painting, come and see it. Uh, but she's living in seclusion. And the only person who gets to see her is the only person she trusts, who is Henry Russell, who's Kirkpatrick's assistant. But his yeah. intentions are not honourable. He seduces her and then he drops her off at Muchley Putnam, which is a, uh, a smelly port. I say smelly because they actually uh, make a living from drying fish on the beach. And it is, it is the, the, the foulest smelling place in India. Right. The rotting fish for miles stretched out over the beach. God. And poor old Karen is uh, dumped there. Eventually is allowed back by Russell, who's now resident, and got Kirkpatrick's old job. Uh, and um, uh, they, um, uh, yeah, she dies in her old Rangmahal. Um, tragic, tragic story. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, where is this painting now? What this, say again? Uh, where, where is this painting now? The painting uh, is in the, uh, was, there's a chinnery collection belonging to the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. But rather tragically, when I last saw it, it was in storage in Kowloon in a basement. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you have to apply for permission to see it. No one, it's not on public display. Uh, it belonged to the family until recently, but they sold it, they ran out of money and they had to sell it. Um, well, well, perhaps the, uh, the new museum in Hyderabad might be able to, there might be somebody else willing to write a check because that would be a wonderful place for it to be. That would be, we need another donation to buy it off the, or borrow it from the uh, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. Yeah. Well, so that sort of brings us to the end of the White Mogul story. And um, I know we're, people are going to be desperate to ask, to ask questions, but um, I know we covered this um, Return of the King briefly, but I've got some of the images that... Um, uh, here, if you maybe just want to just let us know who you always start your books with dramatis persona, which I, I love because there's a real sense of these are stories, these are narratives. That's sort of how it's how we imagine our own lives as well. So it's it's a wonderful way to to start reading these. I mean, I think it's why it's captivated so many of us because it's it's far from dry. Um, it's incredibly exciting, and and this is one of the uh, the leads of uh, Return of the King. Thank you. I mean, there, there are many ways to write history, but I've written very much in, in the style of my great guru, whose, whose history books changed history for me, who was the, the, the historian of the Crusades, Stephen Runciman. Uh, and he wrote these books. He, he, again, used primary sources. He had incredible language skills. He knew everything, Armenian, Turkish, Arabic, every European language. And we used to sit reading all this stuff and then would write it with characters, with the literary skill of a novelist. Uh, and yet you knew that these, you know, everything backed up by uh, it, it, you know, footnotes at the end of every sentence. And I very much modeled my, my style of writing history uh, on, on him. I mean, I, I fail miserably, in, uh, and, and he's one of the great historians of, of our time, and uh, I, I'm a, a dwarf on the, on the shoulder of giants. But he, that's, that style that you described of, of, of the dramatic persona and, and putting history very much as you know, the stories of individuals at the center of things uh, I've learned from him. And Return of a King is, as you say, the, the story of this man. The, the king in question is this. This is Shah Shujo Mulk, who is from his mother's side a Mughal, uh, from his father's side a descendant or the grandson of Ahmed Shah Durrani, uh, the great Afghan, uh, the first great king of Afghanistan. And he um, uh, retrieves the koh i which is his grandfather's diamond. Obviously, we know what happens later, uh, both in terms of its Punjabi than its later history. Wait, uh, is it in the events of Return of a King that the koh i ends up in the in Sikh possession in his initial sort of flight from correct. Afghanistan? Uh, and, and according to the Afghan sources, this is not something that made me many friends of the Punjab, I should say, but uh, according to the Afghan sources, uh, Ranjit Singh uh, actually tortures Shah Shuju's children in front of until he reveals the hiding place. Now, this is obviously a different version to the version you get in, in, the, in the Sikh source, but uh, uh, that uh, Shah Shuja handed over the greatest diamond to Ranjit Singh uh, is not disputed. And obviously it's not something you naturally do lightly. Uh, so the, I think it's not unfair to assume that pressure was applied, uh, particularly as he had nothing else at this point. So uh, anyway, he, he, he gets going all, and eventually the Brits, uh, ship him back in. And what's it, the reason I was so fascinated by this was that 
Shah Shuja Mulk is a direct descendant, uh, is a direct forebear rather, of Hamid Karzai, uh, the man that the British and the Americans put in, in charge of Afghanistan this current war. And of course, what we're seeing at the moment, this week, this month, uh, is the unraveling of that uh, with the the same people who brought down the British with the Gilzai tribe who now make up the foot soldiers of the Taliban. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, we haven't quite ended up at this point. This is the Battle of Gundamak when the last survivors of the 44th foot are surrounded on a hill uh, and massacred to the last man after they run out of ammunition. Uh, and the gulls still sit on an Afghan hilltop uh, where they lay. Uh, they haven't quite ended up with that sort of uh, Last, last, last helicopter out of Saigon moment yet in Afghanistan. But this was the, the image that haunted the Victorians. It's not actually the case that only one man got out alive, but it's pretty much that sort of story. Um, here is Lady Butler's portrayal of Dr. William Bryden arriving at the gates of Jalalabad, wounded on a horse that then dies under him very shortly afterwards. Uh, and you can see the, the rescue posse coming out, a white horse charging out the gates of Jalalabad to rescue Bryden. Um, and this was the image that haunted the British because they, they, they had uh, successfully conquered the whole of India and they thought that Afghanistan was going to be a piece of cake. And of course, it wasn't, uh, as everyone knows. Uh, and uh, the company pulls out of Afghanistan and reaches uh, an agreement with uh, 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 the, the Barak sides who, who they've displaced, Dost Muhammad, uh, and put him back in charge. And it is the sepoys who have been, as they see it, betrayed by the East India Company, who then rise up in 1857. And what's interesting- I just wanted is to say, Biden... um, sorry, William, to, to, to jump in, just say that you know you were saying before about the way in which you, 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 you've, um, you write your narrative, very much that storytelling thing. I think that one of the best examples of this, I, I feel, is in, in The Last Mogul in chapter three, you paint this picture sort of a portrait of the city, this day in Delhi, which I think was one of the first things I ever tweeted to you, just saying how much I enjoyed it, because you use this, all these things that you've gathered in the sources, and you take us from like sunrise to sundown um, through this day in Delhi. And, it, and it, is, it is magical and it is the most, it's what really um, got me into, uh, into journaling, just my own thoughts and experiences, because it made me realize that actually, once you can tell these stories in that way through text, you transport yourself in a way that a photo or a, or a portrait just can't can't do because there is something in the emotion of it, in the sights, the smells, and all that which conjured uh, when it's written down like that. It's just it's incredibly powerful. And that's and then, wonderful to hear, Jasper. I'm very touched. Um, uh, it, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I I think there's no reason history, if you choose your ground carefully and have the sources cannot be every bit as moving as any novel. I mean, why should something that's invented necessarily be any more moving than something that's real? If you tell a, a real story, if you have, but you need great density of sources to do this. You really need to be able to get into the private thoughts of all your participants. And so I'd be very lucky in that this is a period of history when people are, are, are great letter writers and, and the letters are kept and survive. Uh, and this is not just true of the British, uh, who, who are writing good letters at this point, but there are fantastic Mughal and Indian historians at this point who also write in incredible detail. So we can get into their heads, into their thoughts. And of course, that's true of the final protagonist uh, of uh, the last Mughal, Bahadur Shah Zafar, who famously was not only uh, a, a, a king, a Sufi, uh, but also a poet in six languages. Um, and it's his fate that the moment he's really tested he, he was you know, considered to be a great leader because he, it is under his uh, incredibly catalytic leadership that Delhi turns into the great city of poetry. Uh, and he is the emperor under whom um, uh, uh, Zork and Ghalib compete for poet laureateship. Uh, and so for if you are an Urdu, if you are a lover of Urdu poetry, you look to this period in the same way that uh, lovers of uh, English drama look to Shakespeare. Uh, this is the golden age. Um, and uh, it's a very tragic tale of how this king, who had he died in 1855, would be remembered as this major cultural figure who brought so much out of so little, because by this stage, the Mughal lost their empire, money, 
And yet it's a period of extraordinary painting. It's a period which I, I did an exhibition in, in London last year, the uh, Forgotten Masters, which showed a lot of the painting from the Deadlands period. Um, which I managed to get to, which was, it was brilliant. Thank you. Um, and uh, a period, that, you know, the great period of, of poetry. And yet, you know, this, the, the sepoys rebel come to Delhi and Zafar left with chance of either uh, backing uh, this uh, clearly uh, disorganized uh, and uh, underfunded and under, uh, they haven't got the, any of the munitions or any of the stuff they need to take on the company. Uh, uh, he either backs it or he, or he betrays his own hope. So he has no option really but to support the, the uprising. But it is crushed and it is crushed with great ruthlessness and no one in Britain mourns for the hundreds of thousands slaughtered in the, in the, in the uprising. Even Dickens, this figure you think might have uh, sympathy with the oppressed, uh, Dickens writes, delete Delhi in his diary. Um, and this is Zafar at the end. I just, if I could do another quick reading. Uh, Zafar is exiled to Rangoon. Uh, his, uh, his spouse is uh, Zinat Mahal, and he dedicates this last poem to him. This is Ahmed Ali's translation. When in silks you came and dazzled me with the beauty of your spring, you brought a flower to bloom, love within my being. You lived with me, breath of my breath, being in my being, nor left my side. But now that the wheel of time has turned and you are gone, no joys abide. You pressed your lips against my lips, your heart against my beating heart. And I have no wish to fall in love again, for they who sold love's remedy have shut shop, and I seek in vain. My life now gives no ray of light, I bring no solace to heart or eye, out of dust to dust again, of no use to anyone am I. Delhi was once a paradise where love held sway and reign, but its charms lie ravished now, and only ruins remain. No tears were shed when shroudless they were laid in common graves. No prayers were read for the noble dead, unmarked remain their graves. The heart distressed, the wounded flesh, the mind ablaze, the rising sigh. The drop of blood, the broken heart, tears on the lashes of the eyes. That things cannot remain no Zaffa thus, for who can tell? Through God's great mercy and the prophet, all may yet be well. I mean, I don't, I don't really know what, what I'm meant to say now. <laughs> well, I think it, it's a very moving poem. And that is a, yeah. a, a man who's It's a very moving day. poem and it's an incredibly moving this photograph. I found incredibly moving when I came across it in the book and it, all the more so when I, I saw it in person at um, an exhibition at the Science Museum. And it was just, it was a tiny little image at the end of um, the, um, the particular exhibition room that it was featured in. But it's just, the sadness and just crushing defeat broken. in his eyes totally broken. broken. It's just incredibly, incredibly moving. And I think, you know, it's, and again, just to sort of really, I think encapsulates as well, the, how intimately you feel connected to the characters in, in the books that you've written in this for this quartet. It's, it's a, it's a real, I mean, how, how does it feel? I mean, we're coming to the Q and a now, so I'm going to, I'm going to, jump on in how does it feel to have 20 years of work distilled to a to a box it, it, is it it's deeply really satisfying nice. or is it sort of weirdly like, like uh, anticlimactic <laughs> it is very nice but it is also i mean yeah it's a very odd feeling you know what it's like when you finish an exam you don't quite know what to do next and that, yeah. and that strange feeling of empty and but not only for it to be done but also for in a sense bruce not to be there he, he had you know was very much my collaborator on everything with it yeah, uh, and so many of those translations are his work, uh, and so much of the guidance uh, that went into this. 
Bruce couldn't write. It was a very odd relationship because Bruce was this genius who just for some reason didn't have all the bits to actually write his own books. And yet he, he very much was the Eminos Gris behind this whole project. Uh, and I'm very sad that he's not there to do it, but it does it does close the door behind behind mm. it. And this is it now. This, these, these are the four is, there, is there perhaps a, a biography a biography of Bruce to to, to be written? It's already out. It's only he only died last year, and his friends miss him so much. And he was such a he's the sort of person just to generate extraordinary stories. That uh, yeah, uh, there is a book out from Elan which came out within six months of death called Oh really? <laughs> Bruce Winnell. and we've all I've written a long piece and various other pieces. Oh, well, uh, I'm and it's a very funny story. He was he was someone who had no money at all. He was, he was virtually destitute. He lived in a council house in New York with a bunch of psychos who, who were also single men. They were all put in this one house. And Bruce was always trying cooking for them and trying to get all these druggies and psychos to uh, uh, to sort of uh, appreciate or do poetry. <laughs> 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 wow. <laughs> and, then he, and, you know, and he was also incredibly camp and incredibly gay. He was always getting in trouble in, in, uh, on, on those fronts and uh, um, oh. getting into all sorts of adventures. I mean, but he's, 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 the kind of, he's the kind of, and, and you showed, can we have that picture of him again on, in Afghanistan? I mean, his, his, his yeah, yeah, adventure. Sure. Uh, uh, this is him um, in his glory days, bottom right, with his uh, Freedy turban. Um, you can see the... Uh, uh, the kind of guy he was. He, he'd been everywhere. He'd met everywhere. He was a friend of Masood. He'd travelled across Afghanistan on horseback several times, which you know, kind of no one else is there, in the modern world has done. And, and and anyway, this is very much his project. And uh, and his 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 leaving of it makes me feel I should now definitely move on to a completely different pasture. So I'm now writing about early in, which is something I've been interested in, but never written about. Certainly not in, in a book level. I, uh, I want to ask you loads about that, but I'm also really conscious that we've got so many people in the Q&A and we've only got about 10 minutes to go. And I think it'd be a real, real shame not to give people a chance to, um, to ask the questions. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick look at what's going on here. Uh, we've got one here from Jason George asking, what was it about India that first drew you to it, William? Um, I, I went there just as a backpacker aged, uh, aged 18. Uh, and um, I had wanted to go to Iraq, in fact. I had a plan to dig in, in Iraq. And uh, um, he, uh, I, I, Sam was saying, closed down the British School of Archaeology in, in Baghdad, where I was meant to be going. And I just went with a friend to India. I taught history in Derudu. Uh And then started traveling around. And I've really lived in India all my adult life. Um, uh, I, I've, I've kept one foot here. I have a house in Chiswick. Uh, and I'm here most of this time of year. Um, but uh, uh, no, it's, it's, it's where I've made my life and, uh, uh, and it's a place I've, uh, I, I've greatly loved and, and it's been very good to me. Uh, most of my sales are now in India, not in Britain. Oh, wow. uh, and yeah, ever since, um, I think White Moguls was the book which, which tipped it in, in that direction. Um, and so yeah. I, I feel very fortunate to, uh, to have this audience out there. I was very lucky, I think, in that India has a terrific, obviously, terrific uh, tradition of history writing. But, but when 20 years ago, when I was starting this, a lot of the history, if not almost all the history, was written in a very academic fashion by academics, for academics, it, often in post-colonial lingo, um, the subaltern studies and so on, which, uh, you know, great as it was, did not really lend itself to uh, reading in an armchair. Uh, by a fire or indeed on a beach on holiday or something. It, was, it wasn't a book you actually wanted to pick up much. Uh, you could learn a great deal, but uh, it was hard work. And it, there was no equivalent of you know, people like Anthony Beaver or Simon Seabag Montefiore or Stephen Greenblatt's wonderful book, The Swerve, or something. You know, serious scholarly work in archives, which broke new ground in history, but was well-written uh, you know, to the standard you hoped of. Uh, of a great novel, and and I was lucky that no one was really doing that, and and, and uh, you could learn a lot from the Aligarh school on uh, a Marxist approach to mogul field economy, uh, or um, uh, that sort of thing. But you know, to get a narrative, uh, uh, a well-written narrative, was was simply not available. So I was very lucky, and that for the, certainly for the first ten of these twenty years. Um, there was really no one else doing the same sort of thing. Now there's a, a whole generation of people like Manu Pillai and Arapul Koti who are producing excellent work themselves. And, and in a sense, uh, 
uh, it's very nice feeling, you know, I'm now 56 to, to feel that there's a whole generation coming up, which, which in time will make my work uh, uh, out of date and, uh, and seem passe, but uh, it, it just wasn't there, that sort of thing. You know, there was, there was an incredible amount of brilliant fiction coming Vikram Set, Salman Rushdie, uh, uh, you know, a million Kiran, Kiran Desai, Arundhati Roy, but the Indian fiction first 11 would have been the world beating team, but there was no equivalent non-fiction team at that point. Um, a, a few figures like Ram Guha, his extraordinary history of modern India, uh, but very few people writing outside academia for a general audience. So um, I had the field to myself for a bit, and it was, mm -hmm. and uh, I have managed to get a, 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 a large audience within India, which isn't necessarily easy, easy um, uh, as a Ferangi, as a Gora coming in. Yeah, uh, how do you how do you feel about that, or do do, do you get criticism leveled at you because of that? How 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 have you I, navigated I mean, that? I, I've, the books themselves have had a pretty easy easy ride. I've never had a really nasty, devastating review for any of these four. The kind of thing that does make life more complicated is running the Jaipur Literature Festival. As people feel, he, I, although I helped found it and I've been there from the beginning, there is a sensation of what is a foreigner doing running the premier Indian literary festival. And so that has got, been uh, more um, of an issue than, than the books. Uh, the books, I mean, what, the great thing about books is they're read by readers. And, and if people like your read your books, they will judge you on that on that basis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, I mean, in general, I, I, I really cannot complain at all about how India's been very um, it's been very well over over twenty years. Let's move on to another question. Also, I, I can't imagine this work ever becoming passe. I think Bruce has done too good a job with the sources. <laughs> um, uh, Ali A says, William, you often talk about teaching this history in schools. What will that What will it take? When we sorry, what will that take when we have a current government that is opposed to any deeper dive into British colonial history? Well, at the moment, the opposite is happening as far as the government is concerned. Uh, the more I, I think people like Satnam Sangera, David Alasaga, myself, are making a lot of noise about the need to to tell uh, uh, the other side of the colonial story and and, and the negative side of, of British colonial history, which simply is is, is not told. I mean, neither the good nor the bad is currently taught in school. Uh, but the, this government has reacted in the opposite direction, and they've and they've reacted in an extremely populist way, um, crushing any reports that have been done into the National Trust. They whipped up by the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph, Charles Moore, and these sort of right-wing figures. And we just saw, as I say earlier, that you know, Nigel Bigger, who's the uh, the high priest of of sort of pro-colonialism and the great supporter of Rhodes, given a CBE this weekend as a kind of uh, as the final. Uh, uh, nail in the coffin, in a sense, of any hope of, of this government supporting attempts to uh, to, to, to readdress its, uh, Britain's colonial history. And it's a very interesting moment because this government is desperate to do business with India and has made it a priority after Brexit uh, uh, entering the Indian market, but doesn't understand that the pro quid quo, in a sense, has to be acknowledgement uh, of, of mm. what Britain has done to India, the negative side of that, which is not to say you have to have a completely one-sided view. There are things that the British can be proud of, but you have to acknowledge the war crimes. You have to acknowledge the looting and plunder, uh, and you have to apologize. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just, it seems to me very uh, basic, the, the, the simple fact of what the East India Company did in terms of loot and plunder, the very word loot itself. And none of the stuff that I've been saying has been new in academia. Uh, these things have been said for 20 or 30 years, but it hasn't made it widely out into the British public eye. Uh, and that is happening now, partly because a generation of, uh, of South Asians such as yourself are coming up who want to know more, who, uh, who uh, they're, they're born in this country, and yet they know that the, the stories from their uh, Indian families of, of, of loot and plunder and, and discrimination and, uh, and all the negative side. Of it. And they don't learn any of this stuff in school, and they know that, that, that there is a story that is not being told. So a lot of these people are now in the media, uh, a lot of these people, are, and so you have figures like Satnam Sangera uh, uh, writing brilliant books like Empire Land. I think you had him um, on your on your book club recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know these people will not be shut up. Uh, and this is a uh, and this is a an ongoing work in progress. But this particular government, Boris Johnson's government, has clearly sided with the deniers and the naysayers. Uh, they say that uh, colonial history is something to be proud of. Uh, they're not going to. Uh, 
re uh, return any looted objects. Uh, and they're very clear about this uh, and unapologetic. And the sense it's all our jobs to be vocal to make sure that they uh, that, that, that they don't get away with that, uh, and that the truth is not suppressed. Uh, well, the truth is very clearly out there. It doesn't, it's not a complicated. It's not a complicated uh, uh, thing. It's, uh, yeah. it's really very clear what uh, what went on. And it's, and it's quite well known in India as well, which I think is what's causing a lot of the the friction, the the ignorance. It's very well known in India, and and as I say, you know, this government thinks it's important to be friends with India. And yet it thinks we can do that without either giving visa to it or telling the truth about colonial history or being remotely apologetic. And, and those are, that's a, 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 in this one, Boris Johnson cannot have his cake and eat it, uh, as he's so famously so fond of doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in the spirit of learning more, uh, what, what uh, I mean, Robin in the Q&A is asking what, what, um, what projects or books are you, are you currently working on? Um, what more is there in, in the pipeline? So I'm writing a book called The Golden Road. Uh, I'm about halfway, just maybe over halfway in the research. And it's about all that India gave to the world, this diffusion of Indian culture that took place between the time of Ashoka uh, and about the, the end of the first millennium uh, CE. So it's the story of how Buddhism and Indian religion went up north through what's now Pakistan and Afghanistan into China uh, and, uh, uh, and how uh, under the Empress Wu Zetian became finally the, India, the, the Chinese state religion. Part two is the story of how Sanskrit and Hinduism went down to Southeast Asia, resulting ultimately in, in the largest Hindu temple in the world being built not in India, but in Angkor Wat. Uh, and part three is the story of how Indian numerals and mathematics um, uh, spreading westwards, first to the Arab world in Baghdad and, and the Beit al in, in, in Abbas Baghdad, and then from there across the entire Islamic world, uh, whence it went to Italy uh, with a young man whose father ran the Pisan trading house in Algeria. He learned, he grew up in there learning Arabic as he would do, went to school normally, learned uh, Arabic, num uh, what, what, the, the numerals that the Arabs used, uh, which were Indian numerals, and uh, brought them to Italy. And his name was Fibonacci, Leonardo Fibonacci. And he brought Indian numbers, as he calls he calls them not Arabic numerals but Indian numbers. Wow. Uh, and uh, his Liber Abaki brought Indian mathematics to Europe, uh, which is why the uh, the numbers on every, on all your computers in front of you uh, are, um, uh, uh, are are in the numbers you know children or grandchildren of the numbers used by Ashoka, the Brahmi uh, numerals. Wow. And I think I was saying to you yesterday that I've actually been to the Gwalior Fort and and seen where the well what we thought was the first ever inscription of zero was, um, but you said that you might have discovered uh, an earlier an earlier incarnation. Well, not, not my discovery, but the, there has been this. The only other candidate for the earliest zero is a manuscript in the Bodleian Library, um, uh, where I'm now an honorary fellow, and we got out the other day the Bakshali manuscript found near Peshawar. Uh, and it's a birch bark manuscript, which uh, has recently been, there was a, first, there was a slightly uh, sort of muddled first attempt at carbon bit dating two or three years ago, but they've redone the carbon dating and it's come out as, I think, 8th century, which is just before the Gwalior um, uh, stone. So the Bakshali manuscript, if that, if that dating holds, uh, and no doubt there'll be much scholarly controversy over it, the Bakshali manuscript not only has the earliest uh, decimal place value system, but uh, also the first zero in a manuscript. Oh. So it seems like this book is going to be the, the perfect book for uh, Sanjeev Bhaskar's uh, Indian dad character. You leaf through every page, it's like, numbers <laughs> Indian! <laughs> yeah. Indian! Indeed. Uh, there is still, I mean, we're going to have to wrap up there. It's half, it's just, well, it's after half six now. Um, if anybody's got more questions, I, I, I encourage you to get on Twitter and tweet William or, um, or on Instagram. He's a prolific social media user and I know he does. I see him frequently responding to people's questions. Uh, so please do uh, hit him up on there. Um, At though... Dalrymple Will. On Twitter. Sorry? At Dalrymple Will. Is oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. Is that, and it's slightly different on Instagram, isn't it? Or am I, have I got that wrong? One is William Dalrymple and one is Dalrymple Will. I can't remember which is. Yes, Dalrymple Will is Twitter. William Dalrymple is Instagram. So uh, you can find him there. William, thank you so much um, for your time. This has been 
incredible um and I highly encourage everybody to uh get this to complete your collection and um it makes a wonderful gift as well thank you so much that's a sad sri akal ji thank you. i don't know